Hello, Flightly First. Thank you for joining us tonight in celebration of authors John Hale and his new book, The Choice We Face, in conversation with Derek Black. My name is Morella, and I'm the new events coordinator, co coordinator here at Flyleaf Books. And with me is Maggie, the marketing and events manager. Before we begin, if you have questions during the event, please put them in the chat or in the Ask a Question tab at the bottom of the screen, and I'll ask them towards the end of the evening. You can find out all about our virtual or sometimes in-person events by clicking on the link at the top of the screen. Also, if you'd like to make a donation to Flyleaf to help us continue bringing great programs like this one in to you in the future, please click the donate button below our faces. If you'd like to support Flyleaf and tonight's authors, we have copies of John's book, The Choice We Face, available for purchase on our website. Just click the button. Um, Beneath her faces, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Um, you can also call Flyleaf Books over the phone, or if you're local to Chapel Hill, come visit us and shop our shelves. We are now open seven days a week. And now I'd like to welcome our authors for tonight's event. John Hale is a professor of educational history at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and an advocate for quality public education. His research in education has been published in The Atlantic, CNN.com, Education Week, The American Scholar, and the African American Intellectual History Series. His books include The Freedom Schools and To Write in the Light of Freedom. Tonight, John is in conversation with Derek Black, who is a professor at the University of South Carolina Law School, where he teaches constitutional law, civil rights, and educational law. He's a well-known and outspoken advocate of the importance of public education. His research is published in leading legal journals at Yale and Stanford and cited in federal courts. His most recent book is School Schoolhouse Burning. Um, I'm now going to minimize myself so we can focus on the authors, but we'll pop back in in about 40 minutes to, to moderate those questions. You'll hopefully be Sending in. Thanks. Well, thanks, Flyleaf. You know, I, I hate that she minimized the picture there. I was going to comment on the fact that, uh, you know, as a as a Tar Heel myself, that both she and I have a relatively dark shade of blue, mine on the wall and hers on, on, on the quilt. And, and John seems to be the only one close to having the right color there with his shirt. So, but, um, you know, pleasure to be here with John. You know, John is, is, is a fierce advocate and, and great scholar. And I was lucky enough to get the chance to, to read this book in advance and was really just sort of struck by the depth of, of research. You know, I'd been talking to John about this or he'd been telling me about this book along the way as he was working on it and crisscrossing the country and looking into archives. And but, you know, I, I when I got the book, it was it was a it was a bigger treat than what I expected. And I really think it makes a really powerful argument and, and brings out a lot of things that uh, that folks just aren't aware of. You know, people know the the big story, but but they don't necessarily know how, how all the pieces fit together. And I think John wonderfully brings together the pieces of, of race and choice uh, and school quality for us in this book. So um, just want to say thanks, you know, for you, John, let me be part of this and um, and I'll just jump right into it. Um, so, you know, one of the things I, I, there's always a story behind the books. You know, I, I put a little bit of my story into the preface of my book, I should note at, at John's uh, at John's <laughs> suggestion. So thanks for that, John. But but tell us a little bit about what motivated you to write this book and what really inspired you. Sure. And Derek uh, and, and Flyleaf, thank you so much for organizing the event. And Derek, taking uh, time out of your busy day, I know you're on a speaking circuit and, and consulted across the country for um, particular education cases, uh, especially with, with the pandemic and, and uh, mass mandates. So I appreciate your time. And, you know, a motivation for this book really, as I talk about in, in, in the introduction to the book, begins in, in Charleston, South Carolina in 2015. You know, I'm teaching history of education courses at the College of Charleston. I'm also, you know, dipping my toe in, if you will, to the community around community organizing uh, in, in terms of quality education policy, because Charleston is really, in many ways, a privatized system. There's a real struggle there for quality education. And there is one 
uh, historically black high school on the peninsula of Charleston or downtown Charleston, which was also the last traditional public school, high school on the peninsula. So here is it, it's a robust, thriving community. Um, lots of issues there, you know, in the cradle of the con Confederacy. But it really struck me that there is one traditional public high school left, and it happens to be historically black. And once I got wind of a proposal, which was becoming popular across the city to turn or to convert rather, um, and it's called Burke High School, uh, to convert Burke High School into a charter school, I really became concerned. And I started going to meetings um, in the community about Burke High School. I started tracking and following this on social media and really just jumped into the conversation. Um, to learn more about why people wanted to convert Burke High School into a charter school, but then also to try to share information about the history of that because I really felt that a lot of parents were throwing around school choice without understanding the implications of it, but especially the history of it. And specifically, I'll say Charleston is rapidly gentrifying. It, it's whiter, it, it, it has the highest percentage of a white population that has ever had in the history of the city. And it was a lot of white parents calling for school choice. And to me, that was very alarming because there are racist, racist origins to school choice. And this was on full display in Charleston and how people were talking about Burke High School and how they were proposing school choice, specifically a charter school, as a solution to what they saw as a failing uh, school. So it really all came full circle for me, my, my research, my interest in education, the civil rights movement, and seeing how people in Charleston were talking about school choice raised a lot of red flags for me. I was very concerned and, and sort of just jumped right in. And this book is very much a result of those conversations in Charleston, kind of what I went through as a scholar and a teacher with this history and kind of living what these conversations were like on the ground. And I really just wanted to write a book that sort of shed light on problematic aspects of this history that I felt like just a lot of people didn't know. So hopefully just to raise awareness for everyone who uses school choice in a way to improve public education. Yeah, well, I mean, long way from from Burke all the way to the, you know, the the hard copy book now. And I'm just wondering, you know, along that long journey, you know, you've got a lot of little nuggets, a lot of big nuggets. But what, what surprised you most along the way, either in your interviews that maybe didn't make the book or in things that did make it to the book? Yeah. So, as you know, especially reading Schoolhouse Burning and uh, just when we're especially in the archives and, and, and conducting interviews and, and really diving into our topics, right? We learn so much in the process. I, I think I went in there knowing what the history was. I knew what the history was. But what, <clears throat> excuse me, what surprised me was really the number of people who were in support of school choice. And what really surprised me was the level of commitment among civil rights activists and Black freedom struggle activists, and I profile Howard Fuller in the book, who really latch on to school choice as a solution to failing public schools. So what struck me ultimately was just the wide breadth of political support that school choice enjoys. And this, you know, seeing this, it made sense to me how President Barack Obama to someone else's president in the previous administration, how both could really support aspects of school choice. So it was really, what surprised me was just how deep a commitment was to school choice. So I spent a lot of the book sort of unpacking that by race. And it surprised me because, it, it, you know, I realized that we couldn't look at school choice as a monolith or as sort of one universal definition of school choice. It really depends who you are in this country. What is your relationship to public school Many in, in, in many uh, times based on race, that that determines what we mean by school choice. So school choice will mean many different things to many different people. And it really, you know, I try to do it in 250 pages or so, and I don't know if that's enough space, but to really unpack what that means and to really sort of demonstrate the responsibility we have to, un to, to know it is what we're saying when we're out here in public saying we want school choice because it means several things to different people. And that was really one of the most surprising aspects to hear, and in Charleston specifically, um, 
a, a, a an activist who you know who's transitioned and rest in power, Muhyiddin Dabaha, who was a local grassroots organizer in Charleston, and him he had many conversations with me about school choice. And to him, it meant the ability to control or really to, to have input in a school that was a, that never existed. And that's how he defined school choice. And he really turned me on to understanding the complexity and nuance of school choice based on race. Well, let, let me ask you then. I mean, it sounds like, well, I don't know if you're just being nice or maybe he, he, he moved you a little bit on, on where, where you're at. I mean, t- tell us a little bit about that. Because I get into it later. I was thinking about getting into it later. But I think you really tee it up now. You know, you're sitting across the table with an individual coming at this from, from a justice perspective in, in many respects. And like, you know, how did you reconcile, I guess you say, how did you reconcile these conversations in your own mind? <laughs> you know, it's sort of this, you know, Hegelian dialectic where at first I didn't reconcile it. I, I revolted at the idea of someone that I respected as much as Moyadine supporting school choice. Because to me, that meant privatization. It meant charters. It, it meant for-profit organizations coming in and exploiting the community. But Moyadine, when, when we would talk, you know, I had such respect for him as a community organizer. And, you know, you may remember Moyadine, there, there's a photo of him jumping over a police barrier to tear down the Confederate flag out of the hands of uh, Confederate um, sympathizers, right, in, in Charleston. And he gained national attention for that. But I met Moyadine, you know, in the, in the protests after um, the uh, the murder of, of after uh, Michael Sager shot Walter Scott in the back in North Charleston. I really saw Moyadine emerge as a community leader around uh, the Black Lives Matter movement protests. So to hear him, it sort of shocked me to, to, you know, how could he support school choice to how I understood it? So through many conversations, just in just really hearing him out, right? It was an opportunity, and this is something that Howard Fuller expresses too, um, not that it's always right, but an opportunity to really gain control of a public school that has really slipped away from the community. It, it's a way to sort of, you know, regain control and to, to elevate your voice to be heard, to be part of the decision-making process. So, and I, I respect that tremendously. So when someone like Moya Deems coming to the table say, I would like school choice, you know, to just give it a chance and to really hear what's being said. It's not school choice as in for-profit management. It's school choice in a civil rights tradition to gain control of a school to better serve your, your children. So, you know, it, it was a hard process, and especially between 2015, 2018, Millicent Brown, uh, the first student to desegregate schools in South Carolina, K-12 schools, you know, she walked me through this process and probably, you know, she was very uh, annoyed in the process because I have a hard time hearing things that sort of don't fit with my initial impressions as a researcher. So really kind of walking me through the process and, and showing that there, it, it's a much deeper concept than I initially gave credence to. You can't just walk out and say, oh, school choice is a racist policy, that's it. So much has changed over time in it, that the rhetoric around it has really changed. So it's people like Muya Dean who really sort of, I think, enlightened me to look at the nuance of what we mean by school choice. Yeah, I was jump in just for briefly. I, you know, I struggled with this on um, this issue in my book as well, and you know the answer that I've arrived to, and I think taking your 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 comments in helps. I, I think the, I think the real answer for me is that ultimately we all speak from a different position on the question of, of choice, right? That that you know my children haven't been faced with a struggling school system, um, and you know, that's not an experience I have, you know, my community hasn't been disadvantaged in those ways. And so one of the things I I have to say is like, I cannot second guess. I'm I'm not in a position to actually even evaluate the struggles that, that disadvantaged communities have. And so, you know, I can validate or at least defer to that, but I think there's this other piece of it that says, well, wait a minute, actually the other people who are viewing this, this issue of choice, actually, I do understand where they're coming from. And I think it's highly problematic. I also understand choice is a matter of, of the exercise of state power or the lack thereof. And I can critique and say all of those are highly problematic with bad motivations and actually going to produce poor results until the end of time uh, for for disadvantaged communities. But 
you know, I, as someone not experiencing the, the disenfranchisement, so to speak, am not, you know, I, I, I understand it, right? And so it's not reconciling. I mean, it's just saying, look, we're coming at this problem from, from two different two different angles, I think. Um, the world is is nasty. Well, let's, let's, let's jump into, um, you know, so, some folks might think that you were trying to, to to moderate and find a middle ground. I don't I don't know that that's that's where this book lands. Um, so, you know, a lot, a lot of folks, you know, point out and we've seen articles you know, about uh, school choice and voucher programs growing out of resistance to school desegregation, particularly in the 1960s and 70s. But they don't know much more than that. And of course, your book does a fantastic job of connecting all the dots, both what's going on at the local level, what's going on at the state level, what's going on at the federal level and what's going on with the ideological sort of academy. You know, can you give us a taste of how all of those things are connected um, during those periods? Yeah, so I think I like to... I try to tell the story in the book by starting with, with Milton Friedman in Chicago, right? So he, he's a, he's a um, award-winning Pulitzer Prize winning um, economist who's at the University of Chicago. And he sort of provides the first um, ideas about school choice and, and publishing in sort of an academic circles. And to me, Milton Friedman, you know, highly respected among libertarians. And, you know, he, he, he's an economist who challenges an old way of thinking, the, the Keynesian sort of economic system about we need more government funding and intervention. And Friedman challenges that and really sort of rests upon what he sees as the laurels as the free market system. So Milton Friedman is, is, is writing about school choice, or what's going to be school choice in the city of Chicago. And it's so critical, to, I think, to look at Friedman in Chicago because we associate school choice with, you know, sort of rabid segregationists, staunch segregationists in the South, you know, closing the schoolhouse doors and putting up these freedoms of choice plans, right? And, you know, Steve Suits does an excellent job talking about this, that these, these Southern legislators are coming up with legal ways to circumvent um, desegregation and freedom of choice is a Southern response to say, okay, well, everyone can choose where they want to go, but that doesn't mean we have to accept everybody, but they have a choice, right? So choice is a way to sort of maintain segregation. But Milton Friedman writing from an economist position in the city of Chicago sort of nationalizes, if you will, this idea of school choice. It brings it to a new level when it's brought outside of the South. It introduces a new language and a new rhetoric to talk about it. So as the North comes under federal scrutiny to desegregate its schools, we look at Boston and New York and Chicago, all these Northern cities have racially segregated school systems. Well, Northern policymakers and politicians and, and school district leaders latch on to this idea of school choice what Milton Friedman is talking about because it allows people to talk about school choice or to talk about school choice without talking about race and racism and desegregation yeah we, so they'll say things like we support a right our right to choose where we go to school we don't want the government the big bad government to tell us where to go to school we don't want some judge to tell us, to go on a bus across the city for some mandate. We want to choose where to go to school. So Milton Friedman provides literally a new face beyond a Southern segregationist. He provides a new way of talking about school choice and he provides an out for Northern mayors, city council people, politic again, policymakers to really sort of avoid desegregation without sounding like a, what they were, what, who are they going to build as a Southern segregation. So it's a new way of thinking about going to school in an era of desegregation. So Friedman, you know, I talk about this in the book, really puts it on a national scale. He, he's the way to segue from massive resistance in the South and putting police in the door to prevent people, to prevent students of color from entering the school to the North where it's a little bit more nuanced. It, it, it's a rhetorical device to talk about desegregation without talking about race and therefore sounding racist. So, I mean, that's a sort of, I think a key point to understand and how this develops to become, to become so popular across the country. Yeah, I mean, and I know you talk a little bit in the book about him being able to look outside his own doors and, and see what's happening and not happening there in Chicago. And, you know, I wonder if, how much of this was a was a charade or, or or not, right? Which is to say, 
I mean, on a theoretical level, fine, but there was really only one way that this was ever going to be implemented. And um, so, I mean, I, I guess the question is, you know, like how much does he get a pass or not get a pass for, for, for all of this? Was he as, you know, racially clean as, as he might claim to be, you know, he's just sort of markets. Yeah. That's a really, you know, that, that, that's a great question and, and a tough one too, because we're, we're reevaluating this history. We're providing a new interpretation based on the same sources, but in 2021, Right. We, we've we've grown as a society and as scholars, as teachers to sort of understand things in a different way. So this just came out. I just put a piece out uh, yesterday about this very situation, Milton Friedman in Chicago. And I've, re I've already received a couple of hate emails from superintendents and principals across Illinois. Right. So talk about it's not just the South here. I'm in, you know, quote unquote, land of Lincoln and. People are very upset when you start to sort of criticize someone like Milton Friedman. And they go to the point where he says, Milton, Milton Friedman, and this is true, sp you know, personally disavowed segregation. He was not a segregationist. He, he said on time and time again that I do not believe in segregation. And he writes about this in this 1955 article, which has become quite popular, called The Federal Role in Education. And he revises the same article in 1962. And he says it at first. He says that if he says it in the footnotes, you have to read it pretty clearly. He's, he says, I personally do not believe in segregation, which is true. At the same time, he believes in the right of segregationists to open their own segregationist academies to sort of to to advocate um, the inferiority of people of color. He supports the right of people to 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 publicly detest desegregation. He supports the right of people to do that. He personally disavows that, but he says everyone has a right to do what they want to. Well, when we look at this history, what he's doing is is noticing there's there's a literal fire going on outside of the city, right? That people are saying these things. And he's like, yeah, that's okay because this is a free marketplace of ideas. We, we, we cannot not say that. And this is still a debate today, right? Do people have a right to say, you know, particularly violent or hateful things and get away with it. Milton Friedman is, supports that. And I'm arguing that when you allow racist policy to, you know, repeat itself, for racist polit policy to propagate and to grow and to expand during the 1960s, you're, you're, you're essentially supporting racist policy. You may not believe in that yourself, but you are allowing that idea to fester and to grow and to infect an entire public system of education. So one aspect here is that he is allowing people, you know, again, staunch segregationists to say what they want and to set up their own schools to the point where he actually acknowledges the Virginia system as a model to follow. So also in the footnotes, he says, if Chicago would adopt the policies of the state of Virginia, this system will improve. Well, he writes this in 1962, and they're closing public schools in the state of Virginia to avoid desegregation. They're giving tuition waivers to segregation academies. They are blocking students of color from entering previously all white schools. And he says that this is okay, and that's actually going to improve the system. I think we look back and say he's, you know, he may not be a racist as we traditionally defined it, but he's definitely supporting racist policy. And he elevates us to a platform where other people are allowed to support this racist policy. So I think it's time to sort of reevaluate Milton Friedman and really say, you know, this guy's supporting racist policy. He may not believe it, but he's allowing this to fester. Well, let, let's, I'm going to pick at that a little bit more. I don't know that if your, your book has all of the details, maybe you have some thoughts, which is, and it's the same issue we have today, which is, you know, hey, look, I, I support folks' ability to go to whatever type of ideological private school they want to. I support them to teach their kids, I suppose, what they want to, but I don't support the government funding it, right? And so I'm just wondering, well, so that's point number one, but point number two is how is that going to make the system better? I mean, how in his mind or in his theory and even choice theorists today, does a system that lets that has government funds go out and support people doing all the nefarious things they might want to do. How, how does that work out for the better overall? What, what, how do we get to that better end game? I don't, I don't understand that fully. It, it, it's hard to comprehend. I think when we really <laughs> look at what's going on in the fifties and look back, I mean, hindsight's 2020 and say, how could you think that? Cause we know 
how people reacted to school desegregation. They they moved out of cities, you know, white flight. They 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 literally barred people from entering schools. We know that people would want to. Um, um, we, we saw what happened when you allow this sort of rhetoric to sort of fester. But the idea it's supposed to work, according to Milton Friedman, that this free market, the principles of competition. So he thought these segregation academies would sort of just die out on their own because no one would want to attend them. Like like he other people would think like he would that desegregation is actually a noble goal that we should achieve this but he like so many others in the in the civil rights movement black freedom struggle underestimated right the resistance of segregation and the the, the strict adherence to segregationist principles that we still deal with today that those ideas really need to be stamped out that you can't allow these ideas to fester because they're just going to grow and we still see this debate today if you look at the 1619 project or you know, the development of our discourse around critical race theory, right? People are really upset over the, the discussion of race in our schools and the government should fund this and we should take money away from it. So, I mean, uh, and they're saying allow the money to follow the individual, right? So the whole system is supposed to get better according to this theory in the 1950s if we allow the money to follow the individual. Well, individuals, as it turns out, and we see this in Milton Freedom in Chicago, where they're not, where, where they're literally pulling the furniture and the belongings of black families moving into white neighborhoods out and putting it in the street. There's riots in Cicero, uh, Chicago, over, over African American families moving into, in, in the white neighborhood of Cicero. We see people making irrational decisions. So the whole theory is thrown off if you just look at how people are actually reacting. So the theory is a system will improve, but reality, people just have a hard time getting, you know, looking at racism and racist policy and desegregation, and they're not acting rationally. So we can't allow, you know, these ideas will continue to propagate if they're not checked. Well, let, let's let's jump in. Let's jump forward a little bit, which we're jumping over a lot of the story. There's, there's a lot of good Reagan and stuff uh, in, in the book as well. You, you have to buy it if you want to get that part. But, um, you know, one of the, the fascinating things that Betsy DeVos and, and, and others uh, have been quite good and, and, and Jeb Bush and sort of wrapping school choice uh, in and the flag of civil rights, which is saying this is the civil rights movement of today. You know, I mean, you know, if you yeah. look at the at the the only plank uh, education plank on on President former President Trump's reelection campaign was get rid of CRT um, and although they didn't call it that, and to ensure that every child in America can choose where they go to school. How is it that that choice is is with a straight face, or maybe I'm just too cynical, how, how is it the civil rights issue of our day? How are they managing to use this language? Yeah, and I'd also add to say that it's not just, you know, former President Trump and Betsy DeVos talking about school choices as, as the issue of, of the civil rights issue of the day. You know, that's coming from um, Martin Luther King, you know, the third, right, Dr. King's son. It's coming from um, James Foreman Jr. It's, it, it's coming from Jeffrey Canada, strong black advocates for school choice who are also making the same claim. But what happens is, and, and I t try to articulate this in the book, you know, school choice is not so much a system of policies about, about trying to set up, you know, state and federal funding for vouchers. It's not just creating a, you know, empowering people to set up a charter school. It, it, it's those policies as much as it is a worldview about how we see schools. It, it, it's sort of a, a, a mindset. We, we have a right to choose. That right, right, um, that right to choose becomes a sort of you know, almost a sacred right in, when we talk about it among parents, that everyone has a right to choose. Well, we're, this right does actually doesn't exist in state constitutions or, or, or the United States Constitution. We don't even provide a right, you know, as you know in your work, right? There, you know, we don't have that right to um, in education as other countries do. So this, it develops over time to say, for people to say, we have a right to choose the best options available um, because our public schools just aren't working. This is this is a principle. This this is an idea that black families and families of color can really get get on board with because the public system has failed them and marginalized communities since the origin of public schools in the United States. The the, it, the system itself is designed 
to serve a very small elite. So those outside of that have been historically failed by the system and they continue to be failed by the system. So when people are making this claim, right, they're coming at it from different angles where Donald Trump can say, yeah, we have a right to choose because the government just provides bad, bad schools. And then coming from, let's say, a black community in Charleston could be, we want to choose how our children are educated because we are being underserved by this. We have a right for our voices to be heard. Those are very different claims that we're making. And we just have to have the understanding and the patience to really unpack about, unpack who's saying it and why. Well, yeah, I and mean, this comes back to the earlier conversation, but I think this is very helpful. So let, let, let's put some, some meat and bones on part of it, and I'll rephrase the question. Number one, it, it is the case that, uh, you know, African-American children and, and uh, across this country and, and Latino and other marginalized children across this country have the state has a constitutional obligation to them to deliver a quality education. It has defaulted on them. And I can theorize their individual right for something either in the public school system or elsewhere because the government has defaulted. I guess the question, though, is how Betsy DeVos uh, speaking from sort of the, the, the religious right, for instance, or, or sort of the, the wealthy class that thinks it pays too many taxes, how do they have a right? Because the government actually isn't defaulting on its obligation to them. I mean, our, our predominantly white, you know, suburban schools are, are the envy of the world. When we say our schools are failing, we're, people are really talking about a subset of our schools. Yeah, so here, here it's, it's a different, it's not so much... They claim it's a civil right, but I think that's a cloak to, to cover up or, or to embrace what they're talking about, what people have a right to run schools, they are arguing, Bessie DeVos and others, as a business, as we see fit. Because we don't like current schools. If you're going to provide 16, 19 project curriculum, we have a right to go in there and intervene. Or if we want Christian values instilled in our schools, we have a right to sort of go in there and, and you know, manage these schools as, as we see fit. And that's what Milton Friedman is putting forth, an economic language of, of the marketplace and the business to sort of run schools. So when people are saying this is a civil right, it's a different claim. It's based on a different set of principles that schools should be run like a business. We need to establish an educational marketplace because competition is going to improve. Race really doesn't enter their equation. They're using the same rhetoric, but it's very different. So this is principles based on essentially capitalism. Right. Let's put more businesses up and may the best businesses survive. And naturally, these other schools or these bad businesses are just going to close down. So when they claim it's a civil right, it's really an appropriation of language that develops in communities of color to sort of discuss how schools are, how are failing their children and how or what a possible solution here. DeVos and Trump are we're using the same language but a very different set of principles, one grounded in capitalism, one grounded in, in, in the language and rhetoric of an educational marketplace, sort of what Friedman was talking about. Same language, but very different set of principles. Yeah, well, you're, you're being nice. I think I think we got to the point where I'm, <laughs> I, I'm comfortable in saying that actually they're, they're misusing terms, right, that, that one can make a logical claim, a logical claim of a right of a disadvantaged community that the government's defaulted on. But the thing that, that these other folks uh, are talking about uh, really isn't grounded in anything that I would even call American. I mean, as, as I sometimes say, and I'll be quite like if the only role that can justify extracting my taxes from me to pay for education is for it to serve the greater good. Because if what we're really just talking about is letting privileged people get their taxes back or, or sort of pursue the religious ends, then the whole reason why government's involved in education actually falls apart. That like, if that market is where we're going, then we should just get out of the education business. Because, I mean, they're not helping me buy a Suburban. They're not helping me buy, you know, a Tesla, uh, or at least if you're not in the first, you know, thousand people or whatever. So, I mean, government really has no role in that, it seems to me. But 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 I I digress. Um Let's 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 we're getting short here towards the end of time. You and you and I have long conversations. Um, so we've seen an enormous explosion of vouchers o over the past year, and that's been wrapped up in masks and school closing, closings, uh, reopenings and all that. You know, tell us what's going on, because it, it almost seems that school choice has taken a, 
a new turn um, and, and, and just sort of seizing on a moment. Help us make sense of what's going on with all this voucher legislation that, that's been floating around over the past year. So, yeah, I mean, I, I wish we had another couple hours to sort of really unpack, especially with, you know, with your work recently, your, it's a lot of your recent work too, sort of unpacking kind of what's going on in the larger society. So yeah, school choice and the, the, advocates of school choice are really benefiting in this current historic moment. I mean, now I think charters, not I think charters are allowed or charter management companies and organizations are allowed, to, is it was it over $900 million, right? To re COVID relief money. So we literally see um, the um, profiting, if you will, um, during COVID about federal support going into the coffers of charter schools. So we see charter schools actually um, and other school, vouchers, for instance, we see money going to charters and attempts, like we saw in South Carolina last last year, for instance, attempts by state governors and state policymakers to take this federal relief money and put it into a private system. We see, you know, a libertarian argument that more people are choosing homeschooling or homeschooling option because they're just pulling out of the system. So let's support these individuals. Let let's allow the money to follow the individuals. So with the pandemic, it sort of exacerbated the problem that existed before the debate that we had before. Where's the public good versus the individual choice, right? When you're talking about school choice, you oftentimes don't care about the public good or you say this shouldn't be a guiding principle. You care about the individual choice. So the pandemic has sort of exacerbated this discussion. It's, it's sort of allowed this conversation to to reach a new height, a new extreme, if you will, to say, um, you know, that we are going to allow private schools, we're going to allow school vouchers to pay for private education, we're going to allow charter schools, magnet programs. We are, want these to foster and thrive because it's something we learned during the pandemic, so the argument goes, is that public schools have failed, right? They're trying to make us wear masks. This is our right not to wear a mask. This is a thriving argument right now, especially in a lot of these Southern states. So school choice is really, I think, gaining an upper hand versus the larger public school system after COVID because so many people, again, are looking at public schools as just these sites of, of unrest and tension. They're uncomfortable going back to public school. They want to stay at home, right? So we see a lot of people sort of latching on to this sort of anxiety induced by the pandemic and this sort of frustration with the these public schools and sort of pulling out of the system. And the federal government, it appears, or state governments, depending on where you live and who's in control of the legislature, are actually funding this massive pull out of the public school system. Um, Derek, you're much more familiar. I, I'd ask you to sort of, you know, talk about what you're seeing in the legal realm and what's going on in the courtrooms right now as school choice becomes a way for people to funnel money outside of the public school system. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to take the bait on that because I've got one burning question <laughs> that may, that. It's related to that. I want I want you to, to help me think about the next couple of years. It is related to those cases. And one of the, the cases that came out last year was a case called Espinoza, in which the court held that um, states could not exclude religious entities from their voucher program. So Montana, you know, has a voucher program or had one, and you could use it anywhere except for religious schools. The Supreme Court declared that unconstitutional. There's another case right now uh, the court just took in June in which it the question will be, OK, you let them participate, them being religious schools. Do you also have to let them spend government money on on religion? Could could, could they use the money to, to pay for communion, for instance? That That's the issue before the court. I'm not going to make you prognosticate about that. But there's a lot of folks saying, look, if we take this logic that's come out of Espinoza and what might actually happen in, in this other case, that it extends to charters as well, which is to say that charter schools can be run by religious schools, not only run by them, but they actually can teach religion as truth. So you literally have what's called a public charter school that is the Catholic public charter school. So, some people, now here's the question, some people say like th this actually goes so far that it, 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 it it runs the public value directly into the private value in a way that, that can't be reconciled. And that there will be, there may be some states that say, you know what, if, if that's what choice means, 
we're shutting down. We can't, we cannot continue to operate charter schools if the result is we're going to we're going to fund religious charter schools. Uh, others, you know, probably here and in, in some other states in the south, they were like, oh, whoopee, right? The the the, the population yeah. will will explode. I just wonder, you know, what your thoughts are of um, thinking of the future. You know, is that is that the turning point at which some states will say no more? We're we're going backwards on choice. That it, that the, that the crystallization of the tension is here, and we can't avoid it. Or are we just going to keep walking down this path and ignoring the, these tensions that you and I have been talking about for thirty nine minutes, uh, forty minutes, and one second now? You know, I, I think it depends when what time of day you probably catch me am i more pessimistic or optimistic i think you know toward the end of a long another long day as we as we prep for the start of the school year i'm a little bit you know cynical because this debate over to what extent do we allow private religious values intervene in our um and how we educate our children it has been part of the system of, of education in the united states since the, again the, the origins of the system we had the debate before we even had our first public schools in the mid 19th century we essentially have a, a public system founded on private values. Our first policies in the United States were, were about were employing communities to set up schools in order to teach, like Cotton Mather, the old Delure Act of 1647, set up a school to teach religious values. That really stuck with us. So I don't see, I, I see some people being upset and say, oh, we're not gonna allow our charter schools to do that. But I think there's a much longer historic trajectory behind the push to, to, to keep religious values and religion in our schools. I don't think that the base going anywhere. I think it's going to turn a few left leaning charter advocates It's going to turn them off, but there's, there's a much stronger history to support the inclusion of, of, of private religious values in public schools. Um, so I don't think that debate's going anywhere, but I, I think it's just because it's going to become more nuanced because look at the language around charter schools, the debate up, up until Espinoza has been, you know, I, I think that the, those critical school choice will call them, you know, uh, publicly funded schools that are privately run and governed. That was a sort of running definition. And the counterpoint to that was like, no, no, these, these, these are public, sorry, these are public schools through and through. We are, these are publicly funded and, and there's transparency. These are, these are public schools. We're going to lose that argument if, if this religious argument, or if, if there's religious charter schools that are allowed to proliferate across the country because you can't honestly say these are these are public schools if, if you have a public Catholic charter school. You can no longer say that, I think, with a straight face. So I think it's going to make it a more complicated debate, too. I also want to point to the fact that sometimes we forget that in 2018, we had the first charter school teacher strike in the city of Chicago. And of course, Chicago is the appropriate place to have teacher strikes, birthplace of teacher unions, the largest teacher strikes in, in, in the country outside of New York in the late 60s. But what we have are charter school teachers beginning to say, you know what, Th this whole private system isn't benefiting our salaries, our working conditions. So I think you're going to see it coming from both ways. I think you're going to see a rise of religious uh, input into charter schools, but you're also going to see some charter school teachers starting to look lean to the left in terms of organizing for higher pay, more transparency, and even perhaps unionization. Well, let's jump in here and, and take, I see one question. And I think I know Don. I, rec I certainly recognize Don Ingalls' name. I don't know where I know him from, pro probably Twitter. But um, maybe let's jump in there and grab his question. He, he's asking about the charter school movement of the last decade and, and sort of whether it is born out of similar instincts to those of, of Milton Frieden, Friedman and the, and the voucher movement or whether it's something distinct. So, you know, we've talked a lot about vouchers. We've jumped to charters. How do they? How do we situate them in, in this sort of uh, history, and, and, and particularly with race? Yeah. So, um, and Don, thanks so much for the question. I saw it and was trying to talk around it, but I'm glad we could just bring it up now. So, charters really start. The first charter school legislation passes in 1991 in the state of Minnesota. So, charter it's first proposed in the late 70s by by Ray Bud, who's an educator in New York. So, if, if you're living in New York, you know Ray Buddy and then then Al Shanker, right? Actually, they're Teachers and teacher unions are the first to propose charters. Um, really, and this this idea sort of takes off among the union in the late by the late 1980s. They're actually talking about charters if and when controlled by teachers and teacher unions, right? So this idea, yeah, charters develops much later. You know, 20 plus years after the Virginia plans and that they're privatizing and vouchers. So charter schools come after. So inherently. 
charters are very different from school vouchers and they develop later in history. And now we're, we're I, I, I'm gonna argue reevaluating charters 30 years after the first legislation is actually passed in Minnesota. So it's a different beast altogether. But if you define school choice as sort of a, again, a mindset or a worldview, they're very much a part, they're aligned with vouchers because they're giving us a choice to choose how we want to educate our own children. So it's, you can't say charters, again, are a direct result of vouchers, but charters grow out of the mindset of, one, there's something wrong with public schools, and two, we have a responsibility or a right to determine what we're going to do about that. So charters grow out of the idea that public schools are failing, and we have a right or we have a responsibility to do something about that. So it's part of the same mindset. But um, Well, let me ask you, John, you know, there was a, a lot of people might have missed it, and I know you didn't, but... Um, the DeVos administration actually kind of turned on charters in, in its yeah. last two years. It sort of started yeah. very pro-charter, very pro-voucher. And all of a sudden it kind of left, you know, charters out in the woods and, and they were feeling a loss of love. So what's going on? What's going on with that? That that sort of this broad umbrella of choice, at least at the U.S. Department of Education, split a little bit about two years ago. Yeah, sort of a blip at the end of a very controversial and tumultuous administration, right? The idea that Betsy DeVos in some ways turned and was, you know, talking about not funding particular charters or equating charters with public schools. I'd also add on to that this idea of, in Derek U. Terman, you know, of controlled choice. We're a city and we have this here in Champaign, Illinois, but Boston has this as well. I'm sorry, Cambridge, right? Um, the idea that the entire district is choice and everyone can choose schools determined by the local school district. Well, people like DeVos and her camp will say, well, that's not school choice, that's control choice, that's still government choice, that's what we're trying to get away from that. So we see sort of a doubling down among, I think, a far right. I think, you know, someone like Jennifer Berkshire would say an extreme right, and I agree with that, doubling down. It's like, it's like they, we mean, according to the DeVos's logic, private schools are school choice, vultures are school choice. These charter schools are a little too public for me. We're really talking about something else. Well, right? John, so, since, since we've got the got our, got our North Carolina crowd on, on the line here, and a lot of those uh, folks very familiar with Wake County, which had one of the largest, yeah. probably most successful controlled choice programs in the country. And I know I've peppered you with probably more comments than you wanted uh, on your book. Tell us, you know, where, where did you sort of land on the, on, you know, Control choice. Is this a fool's errand? Can it be used for good? Is it something that's inevitably going to burn us at the end of the day? What, what, what are your thoughts on that? It, it'll, it'll burn us at the end of the day if we don't take what we learn from schools that are working and apply them to every single school. It, it's like it, it's not just Wake, but it's also if you look at Charlotte Mecklenburg, mandated desegregation was working. We saw test scores rise. We saw levels of of integration even in, in public schools. We saw social values and attitudes change for the better. These are these are not quantifiable, but we have a less hateful disposition among children, which is outstanding. We, we see, you know, um, and Rucker Johnson talks about this. We, we, we see values associated with desegregation when the courts step in and say, we, we need to prioritize desegregation, if not integration, right? Um, so I think if we stick to the, those guiding principles of a public good, the whole system will improve, right? But when we start to back away and we allow individual racism, in many cases, if we allow individual um, discriminations and prejudice guide our actions, the whole system is going to suffer. And I think you see in North Carolina, when people begin to chip away at what we define the public good, the system goes back, right? We begin to resegregate. We begin to privatize the system. Um, we begin to see, right, um, new failures in a public school system if we move away from a larger social political commitment to what we define as a public good. Well, I mean, I think, and, and I think that folks will appreciate it there in North Carolina, but I think the premise, though, of control choice in White County is, is to work towards that that greater good, that it really is, you know, the reason why we're having it is to have integrated schools. It's just, and, and the idea being, look, you know, those people who might otherwise resist, um, we're going to be able to sort of 
have a carrot here and bring them along. And so that the people who would otherwise be protesting sort of, you know, grumble, but go on about their way because they got some choice. I guess my question is whether they can be dealt with through choice. Because I think one of the things that we saw it in Charlotte, we saw it in parents involved, is that that sounds all well and good from a theoretical level. But when they don't get the choice they wanted, yeah. They yeah. come back and sue or they come back and ask for a legislative amendment or they come back and ask for something else. And so I don't know. I mean, can we manage choice? That is that, that is the question, maybe. It, well, then you're talking about managing individual dispositions and, and discriminations and that that that's I wish we it, you wish you could. Right. You wish you could say, well, you shouldn't be so hateful. You shouldn't hate a particular segment of, 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 of your community. Right. Or you shouldn't fear that necessarily. But it, it takes a lot of strong policy to say, well, if you really don't want to go to this public school that we're, we're investing in and our, and our teachers are paid well and you know we, 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 we embrace best practices, if you really don't like that, do what you want, but we're not going to support you. We're not going to give you money to pull out of this system. And that's what some legislators in North Carolina are talking about. Right. Let, let's allow the money to follow the individual. If you don't want to go to this public school, then take your money and go somewhere else. I think you have to say, fine, go to a private school, but that's on you. That that's your tuition money. That's you're you're coming up with that. You cannot use public funds to go to a school that's not explicitly committed to this public good. Right. And I think there it's what we need that sort of stronger intervention to say. We have a con state constitutional responsibility to provide the best public school system for everybody. And if you don't want to do that, that's on you. You have to pay for that yourself, right? And I think choice is starting to say, no, let individuals receive public funding to make those choices. Yeah, I think you already, I know you already sort of dealt with this or we talked around a bit and the question of, of minority children in, in public schools early on. Um, I might invite others though, if they want to chime in with, with questions here, I don't want to overly dominate uh, the conversation. I, you know, I, I saw the follow-up to Don's question there too. So I think that, that that's one of the, um, to go back to one of Derek's earlier questions about one of the surprising elements were the number of, um, you know, families of color, black families, families of color who really supported school choice. And I think if you look, I think Memphis provides a really good sort of case study at this, right? Um, here you see Memphis and Arnie Duncan, you know, Secretary of Education and President Barack Obama really had a, a hand in this to look at Memphis as a way to implement choice, the way to implement school choice and to employ charters as a way to sort of shape the whole Shelby County school system. What we saw two things. One, we saw the suburban areas around Memphis secede, literally say we're going to create our own school district and we're not messing with the city of Memphis. So even when choice was an option, white families in the suburbs were still saying, we're not going to do this. We're just going to create our own system altogether. Two, we saw a real struggle in Memphis between what in Dave Stovall will call them mom and pop charters, several others, but mom and pop charter schools versus charter schools like KIPP or national charter school organizations come into a city and say, okay, we're going to start up a bunch of green dot charter schools, or we're going to set up a bunch of KIPP schools, we're going to set up a bunch of noble charter schools, like these branded big business charter schools. There's a difference. There's many different types of charters. If a, let's say, uh, Latinx family or community said, we want a charter school that specifically, you know, embraces not bilingual education, but Spanish, right, for instance, as a first uh, or as a primary level of instruction. Or if a black family organizes and say, we're, we're going to have the 1619 project as the mandated curriculum. To me, that's a different type of charter school that's grounded in a genuine call for civil rights, as opposed to a for-profit company coming in there. So I'd say if families want to charter, if families of color who have been historically disadvantaged by public school system want to start a charter, I would say, hear it out. Let's su support the plan because I think when you dig down, I would hear that that's not necessarily support of charter schools as defined by Betsy DeVos. That's a, that, that's a civil rights school under the rhetoric of choice. And we have to, in, in the choice we face, right, we have to be able to discern the different types of demands among a public school of, of public education today. We have to be able to see the difference between 
you know, Jeffrey Canada, for instance, or a struggling uh, family in, in a public school system, see the difference between that family and Betsy DeVos. It's, they may use the same language, but they're coming from a very different position in, in the United States society. And it's up to us to really understand and parse through that to say, well, what's going on here? Well, we're getting to tough spots, John, though, because I, I want to say, you know, as you're saying all that, I'm like, well, you know, he wasn't convinced we could we could manage choice, but it sounds like you think we could manage charters. And, I, and I've, you know, I'm going to give a presentation in Philadelphia that talks about how we might consider regulating them because they've been rel relatively um, unregulated. But I guess the question I'll just ask it again in regard to charters. I mean, is this is this just fanciful thinking that once we sort of let the control of this public good be primarily run by private individuals and private companies, regardless of what their status in life is, we're not going to be able to control it. We're not going to be able to draw those distinctions. We're not going to be able to prevent predatory action. We're not going to be able to prevent, you know, the secession white communities, which are happening all over the place in North Carolina, the charters becoming wider yeah. <laughs> as the public schools are coming. Can we do anything to stop the parade of horribles? Or are we just deluding ourselves? <laughs> Two things. One, and, and Derek, your work, right, inspiring. And I also think you, I see the alignment and connection to um, in Bob Moses, Rest in Power. Um, you know, the idea that if we had a federal constitutional right, if you will, or, or a constitutional right to a free quality public education, and that, and that was something that uh, our country could buy into and say, yes, we have the constitutional right to defend people's access to a free quality public education. I think that might give us some of the impetus or the political backbone to sort of tell people that they can not secede or if they're going to secede from a public school district, it's going to come at a very, very high cost that in fact will just push people back into the public system. I think when we see government step up its, its principles and expectations for quality public education, you will see a mindset. And two, I think, and this is even a more courageous conversation, I feel like if we just trusted those closest to what we might call a problem of failing public school, if we trusted those um, families who are in the public schools, because as much as we talk about choice, they don't have a choice. People and parents and children know the solutions. They know what they need. Why can't policymakers just, and this, perhaps this is fanciful thinking, but we've seen this throughout history. If we just listen to those who are going to school because they want to go to school and they want to improve it, and we invested in them and we empowered communities and we uplifted and supported them, we would see a dramatic turnaround because we are decentering the DeVos notions of choice and we're investing in those who have no choice but to go to the local public school. I would love to see policymakers follow those parents who are demanding change because they know what, what's best for their kids. I would trust them more than DeVos any day. I think we're getting to some great pressure points. Let me push this one a little bit further. I mean, I think what you really suggest, which I would agree with, is that the solution to 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 vouchers and charters isn't to, you know, policy them up and argue with them to death. It's just to create a full, robust public education system so there's not much for market for them. With that said, I think we're we still have or I have said that that actually one of the reasons we have more charters and vouchers is not because people want them, but because the government itself doesn't want to fully fund adequate and equal education. That these are this is sort of the this is the release valve, right? Sort of like the loudest, most motivated. We'll just give them what they want, and then we can just underfund it for the rest of them, and we'll come off cheaper because we the the, the the Friedmans and Koch brothers of the world, we don't believe in government. We're yeah. just paying for vouchers and charters as a way station to get us to this place where government's out of the business. <laughs> what, what, what do you think about that, John? Derek, you said we weren't going to go down this path, but you know, well, <laughs> no, in terms of push, you're exactly right. I mean, the, if you look at the government itself and it's loosely defined or however we want to define it, the, the system was not set up for the public good. It was not historically set up to serve everybody equally. We denied education to enslaved communities, to people of color, right, until the end of the Civil War. And then we provided a public education that was inferior and segregated up until, by law, 1954. 
So we have hundreds of years of a system that just hasn't been allowed to reach the potential that we see in it, right? So yes, the government has allowed charter schools and vouchers to grow because they were never really in the business of creating a robust model that meets the needs of all students. So when we talk about creating that system, we are reminding or, you know, again, compel, attempting to compel the government to actually build the system to live up to its ideals. So it's never existed yet. So it's really a hard sell to say, yeah, choice isn't the option. We need better public schools because it's never really existed. It requires a reimagining the public education landscape and really putting our money where our mouth is and saying, well, not everyone has equal access to this funding. Let's give it to those who confront the problem on a daily basis and those who are truly committed to it. Well, they're probably wanting us to stop, but I can't help but ask them this <laughs> final question, John, which is, and I think you, you, you're, you're stating it beautifully, but so then how, for those who are committed to public education, do we, how do we push the government to live up to this idea that we've never achieved? Or are we, because otherwise we're just going to muddle along with, you know, half-baked choice and charter policies and half-baked public education. And, you know, how do we, how do we actually move toward, how do we transition from where we are now to a place where society will react to this robust public education idea that you're well, articulating? I, I think, you know, we have to recognize that not everyone has equal access or everyone has an equal claim to quality public education. And again, you know, maybe I'll just go back to schoolhouse burning and then also knowing a little bit about what you're working on now, right? If we follow, and, and Bob Moses talked about this, these, he called them these lurches in American history when we sort of move forward. When Reconstruction, for instance, Southern states elected predominantly black state legislatures who wrote into law public education. Flash forward 190 years later to the Brown decision, and that was a result of um, black activists and activists of color and white allies pushing the government through the courts, but also grassroots organi or organization to really put these ideals out there in again, imploring the government to do something about it. We are potentially, and, and Bob was saying this before he passed, we're potentially at, at a new precipice here where we can push the government forward again. But it's not following the DeVosses and the Trumps and those who claim that school choice is a civil right. It's following those who are doing the grassroots bottom-up organizing and you know, compelling or sort of imploring the government to live up to the, its very ideals that states in the Constitution. It's a tough sell, but I think if we follow these lurches in history, if we follow these these sort of abrupt sort of movements forward that shake us all to the core, we're going to see a new system because we've seen it before in the past. We just really have to follow those who are pushing us toward the public good. Well, we haven't lost a single uh, listener here, John, so we, we took it right up to the edge, but we rather than keep them here and see how long it takes to lose them, I'll, I'll turn it back over to our friends here at Flyleaf. Thank you. So first of all, I would just like to take this time and thank you both for providing Flyleafers such a complex and insightful conversation. And as we're about to close out the event, I would like to end with a few reminders. So if you'd like to purchase a copy of John's book, The Choice You Face, um, you can find them on our website, in our store, or you can also click the buy button on the screen. If you miss, if you miss some of our conversation tonight, or you would like to share it with a friend, you can find it recorded on our Crowdcast. And finally, please keep an eye out for other upcoming events in our weekly newsletter and on our website. Again, Thank you both and thank you all for joining Lady Folks. Thank you. Good night.